So welcome, welcome, welcome to our second session here on the research themed day of Shift Ed. We are so pleased per usual, because I'm, I'm so excited that all of you are here and that all of you have come um, to join us for what is going to be a really fantastic um, panel session today. Um, please note that we do have pre-recorded content that is part of Shift Ed that is up on our YouTube channel already. Um, Eris Sharon, who is joining us here as a moderator, conducted an entire panel about tenure and promotion and doing um, professional work to, to get that. Um, so please go check that out on YouTube. We also have a fantastic um, talk about design writing by Michael Gibson and Keith Owens from um, UNT. So please check that out as well. Um, we also have Pecha Kuchas up from graduate students. We're doing a live session tonight um, at our time, Eastern time, um, with, with 10 of those students, but 10 of them did pre-recorded Pecha Kuchas that you can check out right now. So go check out the YouTube, check out that content, not right now, but after right when you're not watching this panel. Um, and so a couple of housekeeping things really quickly. You can see I've had too much coffee. We are recording this session. So please, if that's a problem for you, this is your chance to get out. Um, and then also we do have live transcription available. So please use that if you find that helpful for you to kind of follow along with everybody. And so now I'm going to stop talking, except to introduce to you Kat Normoyle, who is going to be our community moderator and help us out with the chat and our Q&A section. Yay, yay, Kat, thank you. And then I'm gonna hand it over to the amazing and comparable Eris Sharon, who's gonna lead the rest of the session. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for that wonderful uh, intro, Lisa. Uh, welcome to So You Wanna Write a Book, uh, the panel we're doing today. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the DEC for providing this space for all of us to come together um, and really to create a sense of community virtually when coming together in person is still rather difficult. I know it makes so much of a difference to me as I'm in these four walls so much to think about having these opportunities to be out and with all of you uh, periodically, not just during this conference, but during the year as well. So thanks for that. And a special thanks to Alberto and Lisa for their tireless work putting uh, this conference together. They're sort of the faces. I know there's a ton of DCEC people in the background helping as well, but um, I, I also know you've all probably seen those wonderful digital badges that Alberto created and sent us. And I love seeing all of the people who are on social um, talking about what they're doing during this conference. Uh, Lisa and our moderator Kat will be running the chat so that uh, I can do, I can essentially do more than one thing at a time where they're going to keep track of some of your questions so that if they get far down in the chat, we will be able to come back to them. So feel free to put up your questions as you have them. I just see from who's on the, uh, who's on this call that I know so many of you. So thanks for coming. And for those who are new, welcome. Um, this panel was really designed by my colleague and friend, Robin Landa who put together all of the panelists. Um, and I'm just here as kind of the moderator voice for some of these ideas. So today I'm joined by four amazing authors who are gonna share their experience writing books and working with publishers. And they're gonna answer your questions as well. I'm gonna start by introducing our panelists and then we're gonna jump right into some questions that were um, pre-written and about halfway through, we're gonna segue over to, to take your questions. Um, so I'm gonna first uh, introduce Stephen Brower, Associate Professor at Mary Wood University, former creative director for print magazine. So he's been on both sides of publishing as many of us have in, uh, who work in design. Um, his most recent book, Inside Art Directions, Interviews and Case Studies was published by Bloomsbury Visual Arts in 2020. The, the really interesting thing about Stephen and the re, one of many reasons we wanted him to join a panel was that he has published uh, in a, a, with a variety of different publishers, including Comics Admin is another of his titles um, by Fanta Graphics. And so he's gonna be able to tell us a little bit about what it's like working for um, both sort of mainstream publishers and maybe more alternative publishers, because we want to acknowledge that not everybody wants to write that academic book. Our second panelist, um, 
Scott Lazaro is a professor at Temple University, and his most re his book is Making Posters from Concept to Design, co-authored with Natalie Delgado, and also by Bloomsbury Visual Arts. And the thing that I, I know for me, for me, I'm most interested to hear about, and we'll get to this, is that this book um, has 300 posters by 200 um, designers. And I, my mind just sort of starts spinning when I think about getting all of the image rights for all of those, uh, for all of those wonderful um, images in his book. And there's a real connection to his creative work using posters as a vehicle for social change. And so I'm going to be interested to hear what uh, Scott has to say about that. I, Robin Landa, my colleague and friend, needs no introduction. Um, she's author uh, of 23 books, though I have to say her bio, I, I'm always worried that her bio is outdated, so I might have missed one or two in between reading the bio and, uh, ha and, and introducing Robin. And she's a Michael Graves Distinguished Professor at Kane University and is, her most recent book is the fourth edition of Advertising by Design. Um, definitely go and buy it uh, or get a review copy if you haven't already. Um, and like Stephen Robbins works with so many different publishers and works both with trade and academic publishers. And so we're really gonna be leaning on her for that breadth of experience also with contracts and just some of the background stuff of what it means to publish sort of the unsexy part of being an author. Uh, finally, we have Ali Place, who is assistant professor at the University of Arkansas School of Art, who, by the way, is hosting a mixer right after this session for academic parents. So definitely, if you're an academic parent, um, as she said, I think there's tons to talk about. Go and check that out. But she, her project is Feminist Methodologies for Design Research, and it the project that is underway. And so I think it's really important to acknowledge that books don't just happen the stork doesn't just bring you the manuscript so it's this process and for some of us who have been publishing or writing for a long time sometimes we don't go far enough back in answering your questions or thinking about the process and the great thing about ali is she's in the thick of it this is her first book uh, in contract with mit press looking for contributors and so she's going to be able to speak to what it's like to, to have that moment of success of, oh, I have a contract. Oh my gosh, now I have to do it. <laughs> and we're gonna be able to hear what that's like uh, from Allie. So these are my um, my panelists for today, the panelists for today, and we're gonna jump right in. So Allie, I just wanted to start out by asking you why this project, like how this project gets started and why this publisher? Yeah, hi everyone, and thank you, Eris. Um, so as Eris said, my book is currently in progress. I'm writing it right now. And um, the title is Feminist Designer um, on the Personal and the Political and Design. And um, the short answer to your question, Eris, is um, I'm just writing the book that I wanted to read when I was in grad school. <laughs> um, I, I was, searching and searching for um, connection and inspiration around this subject matter. And it was hard to find, it was out there, but it was hard to find. And so, um, so the thing that keeps me going through this process is just knowing that there's gotta be somebody else out there who feels the way that I did. And they're just looking for something like this to read and there there's a gap that, that it will hopefully fill. So um, that's my motivation for doing it. Great, thanks so much, Ali. And you just just to situate it a little, it was uh, connected to your thesis work um, when you were getting your MFA. Is that correct? It's yes, it's an extension of my thesis work. Um, I I would describe my thesis as a project that was an operation of feminist design, um, but at the time I didn't I didn't know what that was or what it could be or how to define it, and I think that's why I kind of. Um, identified this gap that I was um, grappling with. So um, it just felt right for me to continue to research this subject and to learn about all of the people who are practicing feminist design and, um, and bring them together in a way that inspires young designers. Um, so the book is actually a, it's a mix of a lot of, I'm calling it a collage. 
Um, there's essays from me, but there's also contributions from lots of other people. Um, there's interviews, um, case studies, visuals, and illustrations. There's workshop modules, there's manifestos. Um, it's a wide variety of content. So um, through this process, I've gotten to connect with lots and lots of people practicing feminist design um, and finding new ways to define that um, and pluralistic ways of defining that, which is the objective of the book. Great, thanks, Ali. I think that that's so important to, again, when we think about book projects, that they don't just, they're not just born from nothing, that there's often a connection to research that we did for something else or that was related to another project. And um, so, so that, I think that that's really helpful. I'm going to pivot over and ask Scott the same question because um, from what I've been able to see of Scott's work, it's, just, it's similar in that you've been working with Scott with posters for I think a few decades and then there's a book project that came out of that. So can you talk a little bit about what you like why this was this how did this get started and then maybe also just touch on the fact that you do have a co-author so this wasn't a single author book and what that was like um thank you Iris. hi everyone um as, as she had just mentioned i've been um in the poster world for almost two decades um and made a lot of connections and it's a very kind of tight-knit group an incredibly generous group and a colleague of mine had written for Bloomsbury before they reached out to her to do this book and she wasn't interested and recommended me. So they actually reached out to me. Um, so once my head shrunk small enough to get through my, my door, I told my wife, um, I really didn't have any intention of writing it. I have a, a reading and writing disability. I'm ADHD and I'm dyslexic. So it was like, wow, this is amazing. but. And I told my wife and she looked at me and she said, oh, no, 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 no. All we need to do is to get out from here. And she went like this and get it down on paper. And she was an amazing help. And so we kind of went through this process. I'd never written before, not even an article, not a paragraph. So let's go write a whole book. Um, so I had to do a sample chapter, 2,500 words. And we worked really hard, my wife and I, back and forth. And we sent it in and we looked at each other. I'm like, no, we did a really good job, but this isn't going to happen. This is ridiculous. It happened. So just before I signed the contract, um, this amazing woman, Natalia Delgado, she's from Mexico, lives in Canada now, didn't know me at all, reached out and said, I understand you're writing a book and maybe I could contribute somehow. And my response to her is, how would you like to co-author it? Because I panic had set in at this point. I'm like, how am I doing this book? Um, and that's how it kind of started. We work really well together. Um, we really balanced each other. Um, she actually had written before, not a book, which really did help. To this day, one of my closest friends, I've never met her in person. Everything was done over Skype. She lived in Canada and I live right outside of Philly. Um, we still keep in touch all the time. Like I said, she's really a great friend. And so that's kind of how it happened. Kind of weird and kismet and luck and all that wrapped up. I, I love that story. And Scott, thank you so much. You talk about generosity of the poster community, but be, thank you for being so willing to sort of talk about the fact that it was a little bit of luck, a little bit of serendipity. You didn't you didn't immediately get the call and think, yeah, I'm, I'm the one for this, right? That we all, we all go through those doubts at all points in our life, right? We start something new and can I do it? How will I do it? Um, you know, am I good enough to do it? Those are, those are part of what, when we're starting something new, those are part of what's going through our mind, even if we don't always present publicly like that. So thank you so much for sort of sharing that experience. And also, I think it's fantastic that, you know, you recognize your passion and you found somebody else who had the same interest in the content. And it sounds like the collaboration really worked out for you. Amazing, it was amazing. The okay. book would not have been what it was without her, no question. Yeah, yep. I think that that's another really good point, whether you have a collaborator in a co-author or it's your editor or it's your spouse or it's your colleague, whoever it is, it kind of takes a village to create a good book. It's the peer reviewers, right? Um, because 
it's such a long project that we're going to get bound up in our heads a little. And so we, we need that feedback and we need that back and forth to make the content something that, as Ali said, that somebody else would want to read, hopefully that we would want to read as well. So I'm going to um, ask Robin a little bit. You have written so many different books, and I know you're working on a new project to that's more of a trade book. And I'm gonna give you the option of answering this question about why this book, either for this one, or if you feel like you'd like to talk about one of the other 23, that's fine too. Well, this has been a very, very interesting and productive summer for me. I, uh, a couple of years ago, decided that I wanted to write for a different audience. Uh, and at that point, I started writing fiction, which was a kind of lunchtime endeavor. And I, I, my first short story was accepted into a literary journal. And the reason I'm telling you this is that without having done that writing, I don't think I would have gotten a contract for this trade book because it, you have to write it so differently than you write a textbook or that you write a, a trade book for designers, which is the trade book that I have written basically, except for my book about drawing, which is for anybody who's a casual creator. But writing for um, a major trade publisher, like Random House or Penguin, or all of them are the same now, um, Simon Schuster, it's a very different voice with a very different book structure. And I've learned a ton this summer that I'm happy to share with people. And it, it's really been, interesting in terms of how one journey feeds another journey. That's great. And, and a, an excellent point that we're all still learning, right? If you think back on your first books, you, it sounds like however many years ago that you wrote those, you wouldn't have been prepared to work on the project you're currently working on. Is that right? Well, I might have actually been better writing the current project because I had been writing screenplays. So okay. it really, once you shift into writing a textbook, and I'll tell you what my new editor just told me. He said, well, you're, you're really great at writing textbooks where you have to include everything. Now you have to only include one thread of idea throughout the entire structure. One, one through line. Don't dump everything in here. And so it really depends, Eris, on at what point in your life you have to do something, I think, and how where you are and where your head is at. Absolutely, and I think that idea about having a different voice and being able to switch voices, uh, if you write a few books or, or they could be academic articles or they can be trade articles, you get used to a certain voice. And so when you switch from those, um, it becomes really challenging, regardless of sort of where you are, whether it's your second book or your fourth book. And I think that that leads into something I wanted to ask Stephen. Stephen, you've written, when I look at the books you've written, everybody, you know, when this panel is over, definitely go to Amazon and put in Stephen Bauer and click on his um, author's page, and you'll see this really wide range of books he's worked on. Um, the, so for some people, you see this really tight through line, and for Stephen, you can tell that he's maybe taking a little bit more of a journalistic approach and has these very distinct threads in his interests. Um, so can you talk about the different voices and take a project and sort of tell us about how it got started? You Again, you have multiple books. So you can talk about your most recent one or one that you think would be interesting to the audience. Um, sure. First, um, congratulations to everyone who is authoring a book. And uh, uh, I'm so happy to be here with Robin because Robin was absolutely my um, inspiration to become an author. Uh, and so it, it's, it's just wonderful to be here with her. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll actually talk about the first book because I think it's the most interesting story, which was Woody Guthrie Artworks, um, which was a book on exactly what it sounds like, the folk singer Woody Guthrie. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, he was the author of uh, This Land Is Your Land and a thousand other songs, important figure in, in uh, folk music. And he was also an artist. And I went to a show of his work or uh, an exhibit 
of his life actually at the New York Museum, I think in 2001, and there was a lot of artwork there. And so I was really impressed and thought, you know, this could be a book. And I contacted um, the uh, foundation and met his daughter, Nora Guthrie. And so we worked together on this book. Um, and yeah, like, probably like 50 minutes away. 50? Oh, I think somebody needs to mute. Uh, and so am, am, can everyone still hear me? Yes. Yeah, OK, good. So uh, uh, we started working on this book, and we, and we got an agent. And I, I do recommend early on in your career, although it sounds like Ali was able to place the book without an agent, if I understood that. But um, I, I think if you're having a hard time finding a publisher, an agent is a good suggestion. But the agent called up uh, Rizzoli Publishing and uh, spoke to an acquisitions editor. And um, just by serendipity, uh, that editor grew up listening to Woody Guthrie because their parents played Woody Guthrie all the time. And they were, you know, folkies or, or leftists. And, and, and so uh, I don't know that I would have ever initially been published if not for that, you know, that, that circumstance. Uh, and so uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is my first book idea was actually on mass market paperbacks. And it took me, uh, and that was in the early 90s. Um, uh, Woody Guthrie Artworks came out in 2005. So it took me about 15 years to get that book published. So my other recommendation is, is for everyone to um, hang in there and don't give up. Can you talk about, I think your your point about the agent is great. I also want to just note that the sometimes the book projects or the ideas that we're most passionate about, maybe because we're so close to them, it can take us longer to either get that contract or get the project finished. I know that's been the case for me too. So if, if you've been working on a project for a while, don't lose hope. We have Stephen here who took about 15 years to get that kind of passion project um, published and I've had a similar experience where the my passion project is way longer than some of my other projects. But can you talk a little bit about that about getting an agent? I think that for academic books, there, there's kind of mixed um, feedback often by publishers. You know, the academic for an academic book, um, if your agent's going to take a slice, it may not leave you with much because uh, the, the proceeds from an academic book are are, are not huge. It, tends to make a little more sense with trade publications. Um, but can you talk, just say a few things about the getting the agent, Stephen? Well, the, the agent was actually recommended by Nora Guthrie. And so that that's how I, I met um, Sandy Churn was the agent. Uh, my experience with agents, and I no longer, I haven't had an agent in years because now I'm able to place my own projects, um, you know, uh, but, it's true they take a slice, but they also get more money. They're better to go, at least I'll speak for myself, an agent is a better negotiator than I am. And so even though now I get all the money, um, it's comparable to what I was receiving with an agent uh, because they actually are able to get more money from the publisher. Um, so I, I know people get scared off by agents. I, I'd be curious to see what Robin has to say, because I know she's gone through a similar, um, uh, you know, trajectory of, of agents or not. Robin, thoughts on agents? Um, my agent was useless, but I picked <laughs> the wrong agent. <laughs> so um, really, really make sure your agent handles the right market and, the, and has the right connections and really look at the books they've sold. So that, I, I was too green. I was just happy this agent. I, I started out with the A's and that's how I ended up with the Altair agency. And she immediately wanted to rep me. You know, like you when you're too eager and green, it doesn't work. So talk to people like Steven and me. For sure, and I would just say I uh, I dipped my little toe into the agent water at a at one point, and the agent 
said, well, you know, what do you tend, what do you tend to make on the kind of books you're interested in writing? And, um, and this had to do with the, the kind of books I was interested in doing. I wasn't necessarily interested in doing something that would have as large an audience as say the Woody Guthrie book, but um, she said, you know, it's probably just not worth it for you. You seem to have some context and uh, you're interested in writing things that are not going to sell enough for you for it to make it worthwhile. If you want to write a different kind of book, hey, get back in touch with me. So I thought that that was pretty interesting. Um, but I'd like, to, I'd like to pivot and talk about something unexpected or sur that surprised our panelists, either with something about the writing process. I, I know I'm putting fully putting on my nerd hat here. Robin and I are always talking about like, what is your writing process like? And, and it sort of takes the writer sometimes to be interested in that degree of minutia. Um, so you can either, our panelists can either answer that or um, something about the research process. And Ali, you're kind of at the, still in the beginning of, of your process and wondering if there's something that sort of surprised you to date. Yeah, I am in, I'm in, as you said, I'm in the thick of it. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm sure <clears throat> by the time I finish this process, um, I will have a different answer, but I can tell you, um, in the middle of it, as I'm experiencing it now, there's something that continues to surprise me on a weekly basis. And that is the ways that this process forces me to face some very difficult truths about myself. For instance, um, I'm a woman. I have not been socially conditioned to be a person who says no to people or who protects my time or, uh, disappoints people or lets people down in any way. Um, and in order to find the time in my schedule to actually do this work, I have had to almost change who I am as a person <laughs> or change how I show up as a colleague, as a friend, as a person in a lot of different contexts. So that has been extremely difficult. And I can tell you that there's not a lot of cultural support for, uh, for that type of uh, personality change. <laughs> Um, but I have, you know, I have friends and colleagues who are supportive and I have people around me who model things like that for me, um, and what a difference that makes. So I hope that I can do the same for other people and model behaviors that are about protecting yourself, protecting your time, taking care of yourself and, um, and doing what you need to do first before you take care of other people. Absolutely. Um, thanks for sharing that, Ali. I mean, writing a book is a long, intensive process, with even with every support that you could have. And I, I do think that uh, designers have a tendency sometimes, uh, academics, we love to think of ourselves as unique. And uh, my colleagues in other areas are always talking about how we're maybe a little less unique than we think we are. But I will say that in some disciplines where everybody has to write the book to get through the tenure process at a certain level of institution, a certain types of institution, there is sort of more of a culture around protecting time when somebody's in the thick of it. And I think in many of our de departments of design or departments of art and design or fine arts or whatever maturation that may be, there's less of that tradition kind of built in. And so we have to, you know, we're kind of fighting that battle or advocating for ourselves sometimes for the first time that somebody's heard, you know, hey, I can't do this much service work this year because I'm, at, this is the moment I need to do this other thing and that can feel really difficult. So um, we, we hope you able to continue to protect your time. And I hope that maybe saying no will, you know, saying no a little bit more. It took me a really long time to say no to anything. I joke with my colleague. I think it took me 10 years to say no. And so I hope you'll be able to learn that a little earlier. Uh, Scott, what about you? Something unexpected about the the writing or research process that you think that you'd like to share with somebody with, with all of our guests here today? Everything that was unexpected. I'd never done it before. Love it. Um, I I was told by a friend colleague to try to write every day, which really helped. Um, some days not so good, but what not what was not so good um, ended up. You know, you start to work it back in. My approach, again, because I had no experience, was whatever came to my head, I put down on the paper, no matter how ridiculous, silly, full, it just, just to get it out. And so I had a lot of pages of kind of gobbledygook of thoughts 
that I would then have to go through and that would help me focus. I also don't say no, although I've gotten better at it. So it does take a really long time. Um, I was somewhat lucky that um, I started the process right at the end of the spring semester. So I had the summer that was followed by a leave. Without the leave, I don't know if I would have made my deadline. That really, really helped. Um, and it was also in the beginning. So I'm still finding my voice and I'm still finding my voice along with Natalia's voice, which we ended up blending together. I don't think anyone can tell um, who wrote what. But that took some time, and I don't think if I had the summer followed by a leave, we would have had the success. Um, unexpected was what you think you know is this much when you're writing a book, and as you research, you're like, oh, this is great. Oh, this is, oh, this is incredible. And it actually follows back to my teaching because all that new information, I immediately want to kind of tell my students about. So, and I'm big on that, whether I'm designing or even writing, is what I tell my students, if you're drawing an apple, look at an apple. Um, don't think you know it. And that's just how I approach all my research, even though I thought, well, I've been designing posters forever. It, it didn't matter. Um, I don't know about everyone else. I was asked by the publisher, not asked, told that I had to have an international um, showing of work. Um, and actually, in the poster community, it kind of makes life easier because there's not a Posters aren't really respected in this country like they are around the world. And so that was another aspect of getting to know all these people during the research and asking them questions and asking them their process and can you explain ideas. And I learned so much from them um, that it actually changed my approach to design. So these were incredible surprises. And now I have all these amazing friends, which was another great surprise. Um, so it was, it was painful and joyous at the same time. And Ali, I know right where you are, I don't envy you. I think that we can all identify with the painful and joyous part. Uh, any, and it, really anyone who's done a substantive project uh, that has a year or a couple year duration that's new, you know, we've all had that feeling. I'm wondering, um, you, it seems like everything was new for you. Did you did you and your co-author design the cover or interior of the book as well, or everything. was that handled by everything? Okay. And did they um, want you to do that, or did, was that something you advocated for? Uh, the cover, um, if you think you don't get paid a lot for writing, you get paid less to design a cover. Um, our book is interactive, so there's augmented reality, there's animations, I have QR codes that leads you to videos of how posters were created. Um, and there's a website and the website has resources and additional posters and augmented reality kind of things. And so from the start, Natalia and I kind of had a stronghold on design. And when it came to the cover, we were told we could pick an image for the cover and we asked, could we design the cover, um, which is augmented. And then I am a bit of a control freak. And uh, I also teach graphic design. And one of the biggest things I tell my students, and I won't even critique their layout, is if there's widows and orphans. I'm not even looking at you. You can't spend a time to get rid of your widows and orphans. So I couldn't have any in my book. There's just no way. And if I could have controlled rags, I would have done that, but I couldn't. So um, I laid out the entire book and the design, created all the style sheets, um, placed every single poster, the size I wanted it, where I wanted it, along with Natalia. We went back and forth the whole time in this collaborative effort. Um, I was nervous, A, am I going to be able to fit 325 posters without them being postage stamps? Um, is all my copy, is it, do I have enough copy, don't I have enough copy? And with Bloomsbury, at least with my book, um, although it hasn't happened, but there was talk of other languages. So we had to allow, I think, 20% of white space in every chapter. And I didn't know any of this. So um, I laid the book out before all the text was approved. It was written. So I did have to go through that process with the typesetters who were amazing. And um, Bloomsbury said, you get two go arounds. I had six. Um, they were amazing. They totally understood what I was trying to do or what I was trying to avoid. And um, in the end, I was really pleased with the design of the book and the cover. And it's gotten some really great feedback because in my heart, I'm a, I'm a graphic designer much more than I am a writer. And so to let that go to somebody else just wasn't happening. And so, no, we didn't get paid a cent. 
I gave them style sheets. I gave them my InDesign file, which they used. Um, and all they had to do was reflow copy. I even separated on layers. They, there's a system for black has to be on this layer and this aspect. I separated everything for them. And then during the process, we created these divider pages. Uh, Natalia and I created most of them. We hired um, an illustrator, a uh, former student of mine to do one. And that was also, they needed to land as spreads. So I wasn't turning that over either. And then I created initial caps for everything. And then everything was approved and ready to go. And then Bloomsbury comes back and says, well, you can't use these initial caps because if you go to other languages. Well, both Natalia and I were pissed because we spent time. So they said, um, no, no, we'll let you use them. And if it goes to other languages, I said, I'll just do the initial cap in any language you want. So they'll probably never want to work with me again because I was a monumental pain in the ass in the end, like sending things to the typesetters, like line four up from the bottom, second word in as break, then break the next line to get rid of my widows. And they did have one orphan that was easy to get rid of. Um, and so I always, yeah. I kind of thought like, you know, you hear about these actors and actresses that are impossible to work with. Were you the prima donna? <laughs> I don't think so. I just didn't want widows and orphans in my book. Yeah. And I wanted to know, I, I yes. I guess I was a little bit. I think I think when we have projects we feel really strongly about, and especially when we're designers and we've been saying all these things to students for so many years, it's hard not to take all of that energy to the design as well. Stephen, you, what's your experience? Do you want to just say something as a ongoing author, as a repeated author of books? Is there anything that still surprises you about your research or writing process or that feels different? That you think people would be interested in and then i'm also interested in this question of design and and your role how, how much input you have in that when you're working with different publishers so um when i started out i was designing all my own books um and that took um, some convincing of the publishers uh initially and and then uh, uh, you know, I've lost track of how many, but, you know, the majority, nine or ten, I, I've designed. But then one one thing that happened along the way is um, I love writing. And uh, I just fell in love with writing. I had been writing articles um, way before I was um, writing books. Um, and so the last couple of books I, I did not design, which I never, you know, when I started out, I never thought I would get there. And I'm perfectly happy to have somebody else do the design because it's so much work. And as much as I love doing the entire package, and you know, I love to think of them as objects that I've created. Uh, the last couple have been, you know, uh, designed by others, and I'm fine with that. So actually, my the, the latest book I have coming out uh, this month. Uh, is another comics related book. It's on crime comics. I, I did design that one, but then the last two you mentioned earlier, uh, Comics Admin was designed by Fantagraphics. They did a beautiful job. I curated, you know, did all the research and curation, but they designed it. A and then one joy project was with uh, Seymour Quast on Elvis, the mighty Elvis, and uh, Seymour uh, designed that. Uh, and you know, those were both fun projects. So um, there you go. I, I'm, I'm sorry, what, what was the first part of the? Yes, sorry, two part questions can, can get a, a little uh, little long um, to think back to, but are there is there anything about the writing or research process that still surprises you or that you found different as you've now published a number of books? Uh, you know, with every book and every project, um, it always surprises me because unless I know, you know, a lot about the subject going in, um, I don't always. And so it's all about discovery. And I, I love doing research. I love going to libraries and doing research there. Uh, an example is Satchmo, which was actually brought to me by my editor. The editor of Woody Guthrie Artworks said to me, you know, there's this collection of Louis Armstrong collages out in, you know, Queen, Queens College, are you interested in doing a book? And I knew next to nothing about Armstrong except from his appearances on uh, the Ed Sullivan show when I was a kid. And 
so I used to take a, a three hour trip from New Jersey, New Jersey transit to the subway system out to Queens three hours each way. And I just fell in love with, with um, Louis Armstrong. And the more I learned about him, the more, the more excited I got. And so uh, it was just a wonderful, you know, wonderful experience. And so uh, part of the joy of what I do is, is discovery, it is research. In, in a way, the less I know about a subject going in, the better, because then there's more for me to discover. That's sort of more of a journalistic approach. And you talk about loving writing. Um, and Robin and I have had this conversation many times. I sort of love the research part and like writing a lot, but my interest is really in research. And I'm going to pivot here and ask Robin about like the things that still sort of surprise you about the research writing process, the difficulties that you still have, or is it all just smooth sailing at this point? Oh, not smooth sailing at all. This summer has been productive, but incredibly stressful learning to write for trade. And um, in fact, with like, I give up in, uh, in there uh, and begging my daughter who has a degree in writing to help me to actually read my work, which is very difficult to get her to do. Um, and what surprises me is how difficult it is to write something, as Ali said, that somebody else is going to enjoy reading and to not make it dull or jargony or give out everything you know about the subject, but to tell a story. And so when I look back at my first books, I just want to die. Uh, they're so like, you know, fact oriented and I'm defining to if I, actually if I have to define balance one more time in my life I think I'll shoot myself but um, yeah, yeah it just surprises me at, at how difficult writing is and what a challenge it is to make it a good story and, and, and a textbook can be a good story and a trade book can be a good story and certainly writing about Satchmo's artwork is you know is a good story it's just writing is hard and it's not our first discipline and but you still would say you like Stephen you love writing right yeah I love um, writing I yeah, love, love writing and I love writing for long periods because you know if you get that flow you get the chemical release and it it keeps me out of trouble and when when do you write, Robin? I'm just curious, when and how much do you write to, to kind of imagine for those people who are maybe just thinking about starting a book project, how it might live in their world? I don't write on my teaching days because they're very long days. I teach six hour studios with a commute from Manhattan to New Jersey. So there's tack three hours onto that plus office hours. So if I'm not teaching, I write every day. In the summer, I write seven days a week. But I, I like it. And I also feel like, I, I, you know, with emails and students, and even though I'm not under contract in the summer, I'm still answering my students. I mean, you can't not answer students. <laughs> um, I love them. Uh, and so, you know, I'm being a mom and, and cleaning the house. and I, But I don't cook. So... Um, Megan Dean just sent me a book on, uh, I think like cooking for dopes or something like that. I don't know, but uh, I'll try it, Megan, if you're here. So I, I, yeah, I, I pretty much try to write every day if I can. That's the, I, like some of the people in the chat are saying, like I always love to hear about other writers' routines. I kind of can never get enough of that. We're gonna turn over to the audience uh, for questions really in just a minute, but I wanna ask Ali just one more question um, about the con getting a contract and having a proposal going to peer review. And can you just talk a little bit about that as a first time author, as somebody who was pitching, who you know, nobody came to you and said, write this book. You were pitching this book to a publisher and just a little bit about what that's like, because I know that many of the people who are uh, attending might be trying to do a similar thing with their project. Yeah, and that 
process is really is really tricky. I have to say that um, the only reason that I'm doing this today and that I have the knowledge and skills and belief in myself to do it is because I participated in the Design Incubation Writing Fellowship. And I met Eris, I met Robin, I met a bunch of other people, and I learned so much about the process. Um, and as Robin said, when you're very green, you just don't know what you don't know. And I knew just enough to know that I, <laughs> there are things that I didn't know when I was going through this process. Um, so I, uh, through that fellowship and through um, uh, just working on my proposal, I, I developed a proposal and a sample chapter and I pitched it to several publishers. I can't remember how many total um, because several of them never responded ever, <laughs> um, but some of them did. And um, I actually, so I, I got pretty far into the process of contract negotiations with Routledge. And um, looking back on it, I shouldn't have done that because they were not the right publisher for my book. Um, I didn't want to write a textbook. And um, I didn't feel that they understood that. Um, I want my book to be um, something that's accessible and priced right for young designers um, and also written in a way that is accessible and enjoyable for them to read. So um, I didn't really know until I got too far with Routledge to know that that wasn't, that's just not, not the type of book that they really publish. So um, I actually, so I, as Eris said, I have a contract with MIT Press and um, MIT Press actually did not respond to me um, after I sent my proposal to them. Um, they reached out to me six months after I sent my proposal to them. <laughs> um, and they were very excited at that point, but it was silent until then. And so that's why my process was a little back and forth. Um, but when I had a conversation with MIT Press, I felt, like we were aligned as far as how we understood the audience of this book, how we understood the ways to market it. Um, and I negotiated a lot of things with them in order to make sure that it remained the book that I want it to be, that I envision it to be, such as um, they didn't want to print it in color. They wanted the price to stay low and they didn't want to print it in color. And that was important to me. So I had to find other funding for subvention to, uh, to pay for the color printing. Um, they wanted to design the book and I didn't want that either. <laughs> Just MIT Press publishes amazing books, but they're not designed like designers expect books to be designed. So um, I knew that I would have to do that too. Um, and they wouldn't pay me to do that. They said I could design it myself and they gave me the right to do that, but they wouldn't pay me a dime for it. Um, so I had to go through a lot of steps in the process to reach a point where we were on the same page about exactly what this book would be and what it would look like and what I wanted it to be. So um, things like that were a little tricky in the negotiation process. And I will say, um, you know, Robin was an amazing source of um, <laughs> information, but also just calm and support during that time. Um, and I can't stress enough how important mentorship is in this process. Um, someone who can speak to you directly about what you're going through and what your questions are and um, speak with experience about, about what that process is like. So don't do it without a good mentor. Um, but after that negotiation process, um, I felt really good about the contract that I got and I feel good about um, you know, what's the, the work that's laid out in front of me um, as long as I finish it in time. <laughs> I'm sure you will. We're, we're we're all rooting for you. I know you know know those deadlines are hard, but um, I just wanted to circle back to something Ali said right in the beginning. For those of you who might be looking to pitch to academic publishers, and that is the radio silence, and then MIT getting in touch in six months and being excited. And um, I think that the, the turnaround time for some of these things feels really different for those of us in design who are used to things happening much faster. And particularly if you're pitching to academic presses, not hearing back for six months is not atypical and they won't think that it took them a while, right? And so some of it and some of these ideas around talking to people 
who have been through this process, what one of the things that's really helpful is it can help level set us and say like, oh, is this unusual or isn't this unusual? And I had a colleague who, um, where Cambridge University Press was very interested and they said that the peer review process of her proposal, which they were very interested in, was probably gonna take a year and a half before she got feedback. And then they decided whether or not to publish her book. And so of course, Cambridge was an amazing publisher, but she ended up actually pulling that and saying like, hey, I, I need to get tenure. I need to move on with my life. This project feels pretty done to me. And so something Ali said here, another thing Ali said I think is really important is finding the right press, right? It's not, it's not necessarily the one that everyone's heard about or has, um, has the best reputation, if they're not gonna publish the book you want them to publish or you're not gonna be able to agree on that content. Um, it's really about finding the right fit. So I wanna go um, right now to our audience and I'm gonna lean on Lisa and Kat to, to help um, identify some folks who have questions, but I know that Kat had a question in the chat. So I'm wondering if maybe Kat could start out with your question and then Lisa and Kat, you can identify somebody else who we can go to um, with a question. Hey, yes, um, I actually, I've been frantically tracking questions and um, commentary along the way. So the discussion in the chat window has been amazing. Um, there was some questions that were further back. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back a little bit. But I do ask that if I, if I missed any questions along the way, please feel free to re-enter them in the chat window um, because sometimes the chat was getting kind of fast. Uh, Michael Gibson had a question um, about editing and I would like to give him the floor if he wants to ask it. Uh, go ahead. Sure, Kat, thanks very much. So uh, I, I was offering this as an editor, uh, one of the co-managing editors of Dialectic and um, I've read and reviewed a lot of work from people who are on this call, and that's great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just asking, please, can the panel speak to their experiences regarding working with editors? And I also threw into my question, we're not all crotchety evil curmudgeons who eat nails for breakfast. We are trying to help authors such as yourselves write better and make your work more effective. I'll also throw in my, and, and you know, yeah, it's, it's like, feel sorry for a lawyer, feel sorry for an editor. Um, it's it's a incredibly time consuming, lonely and often thankless task that is incredibly necessary. Uh, so just if I, if you guys could please speak to uh, what, what, I mean, I, I became an editor after I had had uh, an enormous amount of my work edited. Um, so just uh, would love to hear the panel speak to what y'all's experiences have been like, what you've learned from working with editors. And again, we, we don't have all have little horns coming out of the sides of our heads. Thanks, Michael. And, and I absolutely concur. Um, and thanks for the work you and the dialectic team doing editing and referring people to copy editors and all of that. I mean, editing makes better writing, period. That's, uh, you know, <laughs> that's, that's been my mantra for years. It's certainly been my experience with my own work. Um, Robin, do you want to say a couple words about editors? You've worked with a bunch of them, and uh, you want to talk about that? Unlike Michael's generosity, most book editors don't help you. Um, I know Michael is a great source of help for, for everybody who submits and um, some of the other journal editors but it's really rare to get an editor at a book publisher who will help you. There, there are, you get several different editors. I'll just throw this out quickly. You have an acquisitions editor or um, a commissioning editor, which is what they call them in, in England. And that's the person that gets, brings your book into the publisher and offers you a contract. It's then usually handed off to a development editor or a product editor who guides the process. However, some publishers have been skimping lately because of issues with money. So sometimes there is no development editor. 
and you're just left hanging. That happened to one of our design incubation uh, fellows who wrote, a, who got a book and, and then used me as her development editor because, you know, gratis because she was just like left there. And then it goes to a copy editor who was a freelancer and who they're paying $15 an hour to and who's likely to insert mistakes rather than correct anything. Um, so now I have a, a senior editor at uh, an acquisitions editor who is also my development editor, but uh, she's not gonna do anything except answer any critical question I have. And um, then I have an editor now at Barrett Kohler, and he has been the greatest mentor I've ever had in my life. Uh, absolutely taught me a ton this summer. So you never know. I, I think that's exactly right. Good editing is invaluable. Um, and I think when one of the things that when we talk to folks like Michael and editors at other um, academic journals is that the whole peer review process is really designed to give you that feedback in a way that it doesn't always happen um, with book publishing. And it does sometimes like Rob, you can hear Robin has had really good experiences and really not such great experiences. So I'm curious, Stephen, you've worked with different publishers and kind of different genres. What's your experience with kind of editorial feedback or just the editing process? Uh, my, my favorite kind of editor is one that makes me look smarter. Um, and uh, I've had a few of those and, and just love them. It, it was, you know, a wonderful process. I've also had the experience where editors were trying to dumb down the writing for a more, you know, general audience. And so those were unpleasant experiences. Uh, these days, and, you know, I never really thought about it as budget cuts, but these days it's more the copy editor than, than an actual editor, you know, who, who works on the, um, the text with you. And so it had, I, I, or, or perhaps it's just, um, you know, they like what I'm writing. I'm not sure, but these days I'm, I'm uh, more likely just to be given a copy editor than a, a full editor. Yeah, and I think that that's a great point. Um, it could, it, that may be sort of an artifact of, of you having written uh, a number of books and being a pretty confident writer. I have to say though, that I have found that working with different publishers, that editorial experience is very different. And typically the acquisitions editors are very responsive. Um, and you can negotiate in that that acquisitions editor be, you know, stays with you through the project sometimes. Um, they tend to be, they tend to just have a different feel. I think the development editors or the editors who sort of help along the way maybe just have too many projects. I worked very briefly, I mean, a couple months um, actually as an intern for a publisher. And I remember sitting in on a, on a meeting where they said, you know, maybe more editorial oversight on this project would have resulted in better sales. And that's something that I'm, continue to be really interested in is whether or not by sort of taking out more of the editing in some of the projects that we do, if the publishers are actually sort of shooting themselves in the foot um, with short-term savings, because in my experience where I've had more editorial oversight um, from a good editor, the project has just been so much better and has sold better. And so those things kind of go hand in hand. Um, Scott, you, you were on a, it was, it was your first project. You didn't know a lot about the process. How much help, editorial help did you get? Upkiss. Um, our development editor basically was counting words, making sure we had our images, and then we were meeting deadlines. About halfway through the process, because Natalia and I, neither of us had written before, we insisted on a peer review. And so we had three peer reviews at that point. They were invaluable. Um, they really, really helped. And then, and this was not unusual, I know some of you published at Bloomsbury, but there was a, quite a lot of money out of pocket. Um, we paid for an editor in the end because we just weren't getting feedback. Um, we were given a minuscule budget, which we use for our timeline. So um, anyone who works at Bloomsbury knows what I'm talking about. There's a very 
detailed Excel sheet for every image in the book and it's got to be numbered and by chapter and I hired a student there's just wasn't enough time to gather the information get all that information so unfortunately there was a lot of out of pocket at least this was an academic book for Bloomsbury my first book I don't know if that changes or not um, but yeah it cost me money to get it edited and we had to insist on things um, otherwise it would have been the copy editor which really is just correcting my experience, like punctuation. But we didn't get a whole lot of feedback from Bloomsbury. Absolutely, and I think that that depends on the publisher, but that is becoming more common as, as publishers are trying to um, save money along the way. Is there, is there another question from the chat that uh, Lisa or Kat, you think we should be getting to? Uh, there were some questions about uh, designing and writing books um, and how to negotiate those two things. I think we answered a lot of that in the conversation, but we could open it up and see if there were, was anything else that we wanted to add about that. I, I think it'd be great to go to an, a question that we haven't addressed at all to make sure that we um, hear from folks who might have completely different questions. There's another question um, about what do proposals look like? Um, it's kind of a big general question, but that could be a good starting off point. That was from Gary Meacher. Great, that one's good. Gary, do you wanna ask that or expand on that thought? Um, sure, I don't, I don't know that there's much more to expand other than um, I'm sort of drawn to what Stephen was saying about, you know, maybe you're, you have like this passion, something you're really into. And it's like, hey, I would love to just pour all my nerdy energy into it and write a book. How do I do that? Do I literally just call someone and say, hey, I'm nerdy about this. Please let me write a book. Like, what's that look like? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's great. Steven, you want to start with that? And then we'll maybe go to Allie, who's, who's done this most recently. Um, sure. So it, for me, it always starts with a written proposal. And um, I, I actually have an outline uh, that I created over the years. Uh, it was probably Robin who sent me the first proposal um, to take a look at. Uh, and so that includes an overview, uh, who the audience is, um, competing titles. Uh, and, and then um, very often they'll ask for a sample chapter. Sometimes I'll just provide a table of contents if, you know, um, I really hate to write too much if I'm not getting paid for it, um, but uh, I would be happy to share that with anybody who, who contacted me. I could send you the outline of the written proposal. I don't think you'll get too far. Um, one, uh, you know, sort of just making a phone call and two, just sending a manuscript in because that's the, you know, slush file that they, you know, that eventually gets looked at, but uh, really the professional way to do it, I believe, um, is, is to have a written proposal that you send to the publisher. Yeah, that's great, Stephen. I think most publishers want that proposal. Some editors who are a little more accessible might take a query um, that's, you know, a few lines, hey, is this even something that you're commissioning for? Uh, but even if the answer is yes, then they're immediately going to say that you need a proposal. Allie, what was your experience like with the proposal? Yeah, I'll say again, this is where the Design Incubation Fellowship really helped me because by the end of that fellowship, I had a proposal that I felt was in really good shape and a sample chapter too. Um, um, I think, as you said, Eris, every publisher is different and, um, you know, there's a lot of things about the process that are unseen and confusing, but I think the proposal submission process is pretty straightforward. They always have a page on their website. They have instructions. They have a template to download. They have an email address to send it to. It's just a matter of following instructions. Um, and it's, I mean, occasionally it's like, you know, someone introduces you to someone they know there, like if you want to do that, but that's not really necessary. Um, you know, it's just a matter of following the instructions that each publisher has. Um, but I will say that the process of just getting someone to talk to you or the process of getting your proposal peer reviewed, um, you know, that can be tricky. Keep in mind as you're writing your proposal that 
the only thing the publisher really cares about is will this book sell? And so there are key aspects of that proposal that correlate to that question. And they are, what titles are you competing with? Who's gonna buy it? Why are they gonna buy it? Why are they gonna read it? So just keep in mind those questions. Um, obviously they wanna know that you're an expert in this subject. Obviously they want to know that you can write, but um, just the simple question of will this book sell? Um, you can answer that through a lot of different aspects of the proposal. Um, so just keep that in mind. But the process of getting it seen and getting it in front of people and getting it peer reviewed is, it can be harrowing. Um, the academic publishing industry is rife with sexism. It's rife with elitism. Um, it's rife with gatekeeping. Um, be prepared for encountering some of that um, in peer review in lots of different parts of the process. So um, I can't, you know, I can't not mention that. <laughs> Great, thanks, Sally. Um, Robin, I have some additional thoughts. I, I would just, before Robin starts, I just want to say that underline something that a couple people said so that if, if you didn't cue in on that, I think an important thing is that most publishers have a proposal form on their website. And even if somebody doesn't, you can use the proposal form probably from a different publisher's website because they, they're all really very similar. Uh, Robin? I just wanted to mention that it's important to really carefully think about competing titles, competing books. A lot of people will say there is no competition. That doesn't really help the publisher. Um, and that's probably not the case. I mean, it might be the case with uh, Ali's book and, and certainly some of Stephen's books, but there, there's usually something that, that either dovetails or something, but it really, it's sort of like if you're pitching a screenplay, you know, you go in and say, it's Get Out meets Rocket. You, you've got to give them the context. Then they also will look up to see if that competing book has sold. Believe it or not, they can look up every sale of every book. They, ha they have the software for that. So the competition don't think it's a nothing. And you really have to very clearly say in that section why yours will be better. Yeah, I think that that's, that's absolutely helpful. Something that Robin and I talk about um, when we're not in the middle of a pandemic and stuck in our, our whatever our four walls may be, is that one of the best places to figure out how and where your book belongs is the CAA Book Fair. Um, so a trip to CAA's book fair, the acquisitions editors are there for all of those publishers. It's not just to sell books and you can actually meet them face to face and kind of do your elevator pitch directly to a person. Um, obviously that has not been so easy to mimic in the online virtual environment uh, in the last couple of years, but hopefully if things open up and CAA is in person again, it's well worth the price of the flight um, and the 30 bucks or whatever it is to get into the book fair to go to CAA. We've had a number of authors get contracts and or at least figure out how to position their books because they were able to meet people face to face. It's pretty much the only place to do that. Uh, before we go on to another question, I, I want to just circle back to Stephen because you, Stephen, you've worked with some more alternative publishers and I'm wondering what the process looks like for these books that are published on, on comics. And I, I read one of the publishers, um, they, I think they said that they're looking for the unusual and something really different and sort of the opposite of some of what we're talking about. So I just want to acknowledge that there are different publishers and so some of the projects might not fit into what we've been talking about. And Stephen, can you speak to, to these niche publishers? Well, um, actually, the there's really very little difference between working with um, Rizzoli or Abrams, uh, which are you know more um, trade art publishers, and, and Fantagraphics, or um, I mean Craigio, um, IDW, Craigio may be the the most niche of, of all of them, but uh, the process is really the same, and uh, and so I, I write a proposal, I send it to them. Um, I mean, now, as you mentioned, I could probably, and I do, just throw out an idea and see if they're interested because I have a relationship with them. Uh, so it's, re it's really not that different. What is different, I think, is marketing and uh, distribution. 
the the larger companies have much you know wider marketing campaigns and uh, and the um, smaller or comics related ones I've done um, have much less so uh, so that that's you know it's sort of at the back end that I, I do experience a difference I have to do a lot of the marketing myself for those books uh, Whereas, you know, with Abrams, they, they, you know, have a whole department in place to promote everything. Thanks. Uh, that's, that's really helpful to know because that means once you've done the proposal process for one kind of project, if you do switch to a project um, that feels really different or has a different audience and you're working with one of these niche publishers, you're, you're not going to be learning from scratch again. One of the things I just saw in a chat that I that Gary mentioned that I just wanted to circle back to really quickly is this idea of competitive title, that it seems really counterintuitive that publishers would like you to be able to show competitive titles that sell well. Um, it's absolutely the case. And if you can all remember back to when we used to go to bookstores all the time and you might have been in a Barnes and Noble and you saw like the section of all the design books and this huge section of typography books and huge section of color books and you know a few books on posters and a few on other things and then like one of everything else there's a reason that the you know the publishers are like oh another typography book you do have to position it as as what makes it a little bit different but they know there's a market that they you know if we have let's say 100 people on this call they know that 30 of those people are going to be more likely to buy a book on typography even if they have five on their shelf right and so that is incredibly comforting to the publisher even if some of us who are academic might sort of roll our eyes and be like another typography book or another book on color. That's where the market is and, that, and that's what the sales team um, is looking for. And that's after you go through the editorial process um, or review with the editor and your book proposal, they're taking that to the sales team and they've got to pitch it to the sales team. Um, Robin, you want to talk, I know you love talking about this, the salesy part of things. <laughs> yes, um, there are, three gatekeepers at the publisher as Eris just, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I get very excited about this. Um, there's the uh, acquisitions editor or the commissioning editor. That person has to say yes. Then it goes to the editorial board, all the editors, and they have to say yes. And then it goes to the publication board, which includes the sales and marketing team. And that's where you can get into trouble if you don't write your sales pitch and as Aggie wrote it really well in the chat that's where your hook is that's who you write your your primary audience do not write it's for everyone it's never for everyone you know unless you're Michelle Obama but <laughs> other, other than her it's not for everyone right so keep that in mind absolutely is there some some uh, Lisa and Kat, is there something else in the chat, somebody else in the chat that we should be getting to? So there was some discussion um, about pitching a book that is like on an obscure subject and then um, a lot of threads about what exactly is publishing, um, how things are expanding beyond books. Uh, and then I'm tying another question in together just to, to um, get people thinking, but another question, um, what have you discovered pros and cons for publishing a book for online delivery too? So just thinking about there's different formats of what a book can take. Um, and then of course, in publishing, what is publishing beyond the book? Yeah, so let's, let's tackle that sort of what is publishing today and where it goes beyond the book and why why we do or don't stay with the books. And I just want to sort of acknowledge that the folks in this, on this call here were primarily academics. And so uh, when we think about publishing books, one of the reasons that we publish is because it's something valued by our, the institutions that we work for that pay our check every two weeks, right? And that might be helpful through the tenure and promotion process. And so um, I know that for some folks, the book feel, you know, depending on the content, the book can feel like a little bit of an antiquated method of delivery for some of that content. And so I think that that's a tension that's worth sort of noting online content. And I'm going to start with Scott, because I know you said you have QR codes and some 
um, virtual reality, some, you know, some my other hook. kinds of content, right? That was my hook. Um, yeah. I, I said, very involved in posters. I'm very involved in technology. I um, been teaching augmented reality and animated posters, and I knew I wanted it in the book. Um, I sort of speaking about other books on color. I, I we we knew that we have to talk about color and color theory, but we also knew that wasn't what the book was about. So we have throughout the book um, uh, little sites instead of numbers. It says MR, which means making posters resources. So anytime we talk about something that was important to poster design, but we didn't want to get too deep in, like we didn't want to have a whole chapter on color theory, uh, we spoke about it and we referred them to a website. The website has tons of links to all kinds of sources, which I use for my students as well. Um, it's interesting with my book because a, a close friend of mine downloaded the digital version and I'm like, you can't read my book in the digital version. So I sent him a print version and his response was there was a dramatic difference for him, um, especially dealing with posters, design, color, um, to actually have it in print made a difference to him. So I'm kind of in between. Uh, I still like print, but you can see my gray beard says I'm old. And, and um, I, I still teach, and so I, uh, I actually teach a class that is a hybrid book, like my book, that has both, it's interactive. Um, so it engages the reader, and all you need is a smartphone to see the AR, to see the animated posters, to get the behind the scenes info. Um, so it, I, we wanted it to, I mean, you're appealing to an age group here, college students. They're very techy. They have their phones with them. So that was a big part of our pitch. Um, and I mentioned in the chat having a hook. And I, I do believe, because uh, there's a lot of great poster books written by amazing authors. And I, I think the fact that ours was so different um, had a lot to do with it. Yeah, um, something I just want to note I think that's really great information, Scott. I'm going to go to Allie next and ask, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a newer faculty, you have a book in process. Why does it belong as a book? But I just want to know, I'm going to put my hat on as the publisher editor for a second, because I've been on calls where we've asked directly about, okay, so if it's going to, if we're doing online textbooks or if we're doing online content, um, shouldn't it cost less? And I do want to just say that I, I feel like I've gotten the answer to this enough times that I can confidently say that their publishers say that there's not a real difference in their production costs um, between online and print, uh, that there's costs that are incurred for these online platforms that are fairly comparable to the, what they're paying for print. And so for folks who are saying, well, you know, it should be half the price online, you know, if it's a digital version, um, that, that, does, that model doesn't actually work for the publishers. They, they don't see a huge difference. It's just kind of a different, larger market for them. So Ali, you wanna say, tell us why, why are you, you have a new project, why did it belong as a book? Yeah, um, so the first thing that was important to me, and I think I kind of mentioned this is that, um, I, it was really important to me that I write to an audience that was not my peers. <laughs> um, the content of my book and the information in there and the knowledge that I want to share um, from other people, um, it's not necessarily um, a book for academics, although they will get something out of it. Um, I wanted to write to an audience that is um, more interested in the subject matter and more, um, I think, hungry for the subject matter. And um, so I thought I've written some papers, I've written some academic papers about this um, and it just didn't feel like the right audience for it. Um, and so a book felt like the right, I mean, I love books. <laughs> um, so that was, that was the first thing, but um, a book felt right um, because it's, it's of a time and a place. And I think that that's a really important aspect of, of what I'm writing about is um, is what is happening here now. Um, obviously, I want it to be evergreen and I want it to be useful years and years into the future. Um, but it, a nice thing about a book is that it feels like it is of a time and place. And I think that that's important for, for me. Thanks, Sally. Do you have, a, we're getting a little short on time, so I probably won't be able to circle back yeah. to you one more time, but do you have any 
sort of last advice for somebody just starting the process as a newer writer yourself? Um, yes. Um, my first advice is if you want to do it, you can do it. Um, there's nothing stopping you except yourself. Um, but at the same time, if you want to do it well, get a really good mentor or a group of mentors or, um, you know, a, a community of mentors like this, um, because there's so much knowledge that you don't know that you don't know um, going into this process. And even now, I mean, I'm halfway through this process and I still know that there are so many things. I write to Robin all the time and ask her questions <laughs> about things and I always learn something. So that community of knowledge is so, so vital. Um, don't do it alone. Um, there are people out there to support you and there are generous people in this community who offer their expertise and their knowledge. So I want to express my gratitude to them. Thanks, Ali. And um, I'm gonna go to Stephen and then to Robin. Stephen, do you have any advice for somebody starting for the first time? We probably have a minute or so to hear from you. Sure, um, I agree with everything Ali just said. <laughs> uh, I, I think um, just believe in yourself and don't give up. And it does take time, whether it's six months or 15 years, ha hang in there. Um, and, you know, publishers need product and that's what it's all about. You, you can find somebody who will, will publish you. That's fantastic, Stephen. I think I just want to underscore that. It feels really overwhelming to us sometimes pitching for the first time, but publishers need to publish books. Acquisition editors have a number of books they have to commission every single year. And so they're out there ready and wanting to hear from you, whether it's the right fit or not. Um, is more about a fit and not whether or not your project is worthy or good or whatever those kinds of things are. So keep that in mind. Robin, advice in about a minute for our, our newer writers? Yes, um, peer reviews are, are very difficult to take. And, um, you know, as, as Eris says, you can go cry and then come back and really look at them. And sometimes when somebody flags something, it doesn't mean that they're right about exactly what they're telling you to do, but if there is a flag, you should take a look, you know, and if two people flag it, you know, really take a look. And if three people flag it, you've got to change it. Yeah, I, I love that because um, we're so used to taking feedback as designers. And I think we have really tough skin, like almost armor as designers, we can hear anything. And then when we go into this slightly new arena, it can feel all of a sudden our projects are really precious thinking of your first or second year students who think oh my gosh like you you just drew on my piece or something and I'm always like it's a printout come on um but you know that kind of idea it, it, the peer review process is there to give you feedback they may not be flagging exactly what's wrong they may not have articulated that and they may not have a solution for you but it's important whether it's a peer review of a book or an article or something else that you really understand that that feedback something isn't working there and I always say they may not know what to solve for me but they've they're, they're flagging it and that means I've got to go back to it I just want to add one thing you can push yeah. back don't sure. be afraid to push back uh, and sometimes the publisher has sent it to the wrong people too and they're and sometimes they're willing to send it out again I see everybody shaking their heads yes so push back absolutely you can always make an argument of why sometimes the peer reviewers are wrong. Sometimes they read it quickly. Sometimes they don't understand. Sometimes it's just they, they disagree with your thesis. And so that's something that, again, I've had a colleague pull a book because the peer reviewers disagreed rather than make that argument to so stand up for yourself. Scott, you've, you've finished a, a first book. Are you gonna you have any advice for newer writers and are you gonna do this again? Or are you gonna sort of re-engage with your creative process? Don't do it, no, no. It was an amazing experience. <laughs> Um, like I said, I'm not a writer. Um, I'm actually, I've actually illustrated and written a children's book that's going to be augmented reality. And I'm working on the animations now. It was actually something my mother wrote that I translated into rhyme about her life. It's kind of funny and inspiring. And, and um, it's called Living in an Upside Down World. So I'm not going to give any more away than that. Um, and this has been, I get to illustrate, this has been such a joy. Um, going into this, like I said, I have a reading and writing disability, so you all talk about stress. I started this, I had a thick, luxurious head of black hair. 
And my book just came out a year ago. So needless to say, and it was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. Also one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. Um, and my advice is be fearless. Um, I thought the peer review and not everything that was said was great, really helped. I didn't have mentorship. I had Natalia, she had me, blind leading the blind. Um, and so getting that uh, review midway through was just really changed everything for us, just the way we approach writing. Of course, we had to go back and rewrite some things. So I'm glad we pushed for that. I say- I, I, I you love your good? idea of being fearless. And I just wanna, I think we're just about out of time. I know that they're gonna cut us off here. So I think we're gonna let Scott have the last word with that we all should be fearless as we take on new projects. And also thinking about what Ali said and engaging with this community on this call and beyond this call, because it is a very generous community. So I wanna thank our panelists. I wanna thank Lisa and Kat um, and Alberto and everybody from the DEC and all of you on this call for your great questions. Thank you so much for making this an absolutely incredible session. And thank you everyone. This was I had such a great time. Thank you everybody for yes. coming in. Thank you, Lisa and Alberto and Kat. Thank Can you, I just add to you, I know that there's probably a few questions that were not answered and I, I would guess our panelists would be very happy to answer via email any other questions you had. Absolutely. Bring them on. Thank you. Yep, and don't forget about the Slack too. You can ask questions there. There are a ton of people who are answering things in the chat as well, who weren't necessarily panelists, but have knowledge and expertise to share. So please everybody just connect. And thank you so much for attending the session. I knew it would be phenomenal and it was. So thank you for coming. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Kat, for being the moderator. There was a lot to moderate this time in the chat. So kudos to you for catching all of that. Uh, we will be posting the chat. We have recorded the session so you can come back to it. So please do that. And then I'm going to let everybody go, but know that there's more to come. We have a session coming up in half an hour. It's our social mixer for the day, hosted by Allie Place, who was one of our panelists. And she is gathering academic parents together to talk and chat and share. So please do join that if you are able. Um, and then at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, we are gonna have a, a, a session on uh, sustainability and climate change called Climify. So please come join us for that. And then at 4 p.m. today, we're gonna have a session that is titled, let me get this correct, Shifting Inside Out, Decolonizing the Classroom with some amazing panelists who will join us for that. And then tonight at 7 p.m., we have grad student Pecha Kuchas, and they'll be talking about their research. So please do come join us to celebrate those graduate students as well. So I'm going to shut up. I'm going to click off so we can all go take a break. But please, everybody, come join us for the rest of the sessions today. I will hopefully see you soon. Thank you.